At a little distance on the right and somewhat in the rear, the French army stood to their arms, Montcalm having collected his parties so soon as his guards had possession of the works. They were attentive but silent observers of the proceedings of the vanquished, failing in none of the stipulated military honors and offering no taunt or insult in their success to their less fortunate foes. Living masses of the English, to the amount in the whole of near 3,000, were moving slowly across the plain toward the common center, and gradually approached each other as they converged to the point of their march, a vista cut through the lofty trees where the road to the Hudson entered the forest. Along the sweeping borders of the wood hung a dark cloud of savages eyeing the passage of their enemies and hovering at a distance, like vultures who were only kept from swooping on their prey by the presence and restraint of a superior army. A few had straggled among the conquered columns, where they stalked in sullen discontent, attentive though, as yet passive observers of the moving multitude. The scattered Indians started at the well-known cry, as the courses bound at the signal to quit the goal, and directly there arose such a yell along the plain and through the arches of the woods as seldom burst from human lips before. They who heard it listened with a curdling horror at the heart, little inferior to that dread which may be expected to attend the blast of the final summons. While 1756 saw the establishment, success, and growth of the American Rangers, it was not a great year for the British in North America against the French. In addition to his duties as governor, Governor Vaudrill of New France aspired to become the French commander-in-chief, and he worked throughout the winter of 1756 before reinforcements came. Scouts had indicated the British supply chain's vulnerability so he authorized an attack on the forts that Shirley had established at the Oneida Carry. During the Battle of Fort Bull, French soldiers destroyed the fort and an enormous qualities of supplies, including 45,000 pounds of gunpowder. They destroyed any British desires for operation on Lake Ontario and put the Oswego garrison, which was already running low on supplies, in jeopardy. French armies in the Ohio Valley also continued to court natives throughout the region, urging them to raid English frontier villages. This resulted in continual threats at the western border, with streams of people fleeing east to avoid the fighting. The new British commander, Lord Loudon, was not scheduled to arrive in the colonies until July, leaving his second, General Abercrombie, to make all the decisions, but hesitated to really take any serious moves unless Loudon authorized them. Meanwhile, Montcalm expanded on Vaudrill's efforts assaulting Fort Oswego and made a strategic move to Ticonderoga as if foreshadowing a further assault along Lake George. With Abercrombie locked down in Albany, Montcalm slipped away and launched the successful August attack on Fort Oswego. In the aftermath, Montcalm and his native allies would argue about how to handle the personal items of the prisoners. The Europeans did not see them as prizes and forbade their native allies from robbing the prisoners of their goods, which was infuriating to the natives. Loudon, he was a good administrator, but a very cautious military leader, and he really only had just one big military campaign plan for 1757, and that was an attack on Quebec, the capital of New France. 
He left a substantial army at Fort William Henry to distract Montcalm and began planning his expedition to the French capital. William Pitt, who was the Secretary of State in charge of the colonies, then directed him to assault Fort Louisbourg first. The expedition experienced several delays, but was ultimately ready to embark from Halifax, Nova Scotia in early August. Meanwhile, French ships had evaded the British blockade of the French coast, and a force that outnumbered the British Navy awaited Loudoun in Louisbourg. Faced with such strength, Loudoun returned to New York amid reports of a massacre at Fort William Henry. When Fort William Henry surrendered, the terms of surrender were that the British and their camp followers would be allowed to withdraw under a French escort to Fort Edward with full honors of war if they refrained from fighting for 18 months. They were allowed to keep their muskets and a single symbolic cannon, but no ammunition. In addition, British authorities were to release French prisoners within three months. Before agreeing to these terms, Montcalm endeavored to ensure that his native allies understood them and that the chiefs would agree to restrict their warriors. The procedure, though, was hindered by the diversity of the natives. See, some of these several warriors spoke languages that no European present understood. Because of this lack of communication, the Indians then stormed the fort, plundered it, and butchered some of the wounded and sick. The French soldiers stationed around the fortified camp were shocked and only partially successful in keeping the natives out and took a great deal of effort in preventing pillaging and scalping there. Montcalm had intended to march the prisoners south the next morning, but after witnessing the natives' lust for blood, they decided to try it that night. When the Indians realized that the British were about to leave, they gathered around their camp, forced the leaders to postpone the march until the next morning. But even before the British column began to line up for the march to Fort Edward, the next morning the Indians repeated their attack on the relatively defenseless British. Around 5 a.m., natives stormed the fort's huts, killing and scalping injured British who were meant to be under the care of French doctors. As the British marched away, they were pursued by swarming natives who grabbed at them, seized for weapons and clothes, and violently dragged away any who resisted, including many women, children, and servants. Although Montcalm and other French officers attempted to stop further attacks, others did nothing, and some explicitly refused to provide further protection to the British. The column then dissolved, as some tried to escape the Indian onslaught, and others actively tried to defend themselves. Massachusetts Colonel Joseph Fry reported that he was stripped of much of his clothing and repeatedly threatened. He fled into the woods and did not reach Fort Edward until August 12th. Writing, at last, with great difficulty, the troops got from the retrenchment, but they were no sooner out than the savages fell upon our rear, killing and scalping, which occasioned an order for a halt. Done in great confusion at last, but as soon as those in the front knew what was doing in the rear, they again pressed forward, and thus the confusion continued and increased, till we came to the advanced guard of the French. The savages still carrying away officers, privates, women, and children, some of which later they killed and scalped on the road. This horrid scene of blood and slaughter obliged our officers to apply to the French guard for protection, which they refused and told them they must take to the woods and shift for themselves. The siege of Fort William and Henry would last for several days, and the British would lose about 80 men. The massacre lasted only a matter of minutes, but those estimated to be killed, wounded, or captured range from 200 to 1,500 men, women, and children. In the aftermath of the massacre, Montcalm managed to secure the release of at least 500 captives that had been taken by the natives. The French would remain on the site and destroy any remains of the British fort. Montcalm, probably being shocked by what had happened, did not pursue any attack 
on the nearby Fort Edward. Others argue that he couldn't make the attack because the Indians, frustrated with Montcalm, refused to fight with him. Others claim that he was short on supplies, and those in the Canadian militia needed to go home to prepare for the harvest. In whatever case, Montcalm wrote letters to Lord Loudon apologizing for the behavior of his native allies, attempting to justify the massacre. Many captives who were taken to Montreal were also eventually repatriated through prisoner exchange negotiations by Vaudreuil. Loudon was also recalled, but that would occur primarily because of the failed expedition to Louisbourg. Because of his recall and being upset over the events, Loudon actually delayed the release of French prisoners promised by the terms of surrender. General James Abercrombie would succeed Loudon as commander-in-chief and was asked by paroled members of the 34th foot to void the agreement so that they would be free to serve in 1758, which he did, and they went to serve under General Jeffrey Amherst in his successful expedition against Louisbourg in 1758. The British and later the Americans would never rebuild anything on the site of Fort William Henry. The fort laid in ruin for about 200 years. That was until 1950s, when excavation at the site eventually led to the reconstruction of Fort William Henry. News of the massacre shocked the colonists, and the events of the battle and the subsequent killings would be depicted in the 1826 novel The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenmore Cooper and in the film adaptation of his book. Though Cooper's description of the events contain numerous inaccuracies, his work and the sometimes disturbing descriptions of the events by early historians like Benson Losing and Francis Parkman led to the belief that many more people had died than probably actually had. Historian Losing wrote that, quote, 1,500 people were butchered or carried into hopeless captivity. But we now know that many more were actually captured than killed, and even many of those that were captured were eventually freed. I want to thank you guys so much for supporting this podcast. Um, this has been such a fun project for me. As a historian, what historian wouldn't want to take on a project like this? I, I feel very humbled and at times a little mind blown on just how much history this country has and how much it has taken of sacrifice and courage to bring this country about. And as we inch closer to the American Revolution this year, I am so excited to take these steps and really explore and deep dive into these subjects that really are not talked about in school, even in university. This is really such a fun project for me. And I'm so grateful for those of you that are on this journey and coming along with me and being very patient with me. Um, as I produce these videos and post them. It does take a lot, I will say, to produce these videos. Um, so please subscribe, please share. Uh, that is literally the best thing that you could do for me is to share my videos with a friend, with a group, with a, you know, a Facebook group, uh, wherever, uh, your Instagram, social media, get the word out because I really enjoy this and I love hearing your guys' comments. I love when you contribute to things that I may have missed or things that I might have left out. Um, that's the greatest thing for me is to see those discussions taking place and to know that you guys are digging deeper into the history you may know more about it than than i was able to provide for you in 15 20 minute video so thank you guys so much as always um i will see you in the next episode bye